And to be lucky that you're on that side of the screen right now because this has been a pain in the ball. <laughs> All right. That said, uh, let's start with the introduction. Please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is David Miller. I was Worshipful Master of Indiana Harbor Lodge 686 in 2016. Tell me about Freemasonry. Uh, my idea of Freemasonry might not be what the general public thinks it is. Uh, Freemasonry to me is friendship, brotherhood. Um, being able to call somebody up and talk to them about things that you might not be able to talk to your own family about. Uh, being able to lean on somebody's shoulder. Somebody being able to call you and have the confidence that you know they can call you and talk to you and know that if they say something to you, it's not going to leave and you know your lips and nobody else is going to hear about it. Um, guys getting together, being guys, having fun, uh, participating in other things with each other. But it, the biggest thing is friendship. And I, unfortunately, a, a lot of the guys that join, I don't think they understand that. And, I don't know if they, they think that it's some big, huge secret that they're looking for and that's not what they find. But if they came back, they'd see that, you know, the secret is being able to, to talk to each other and have somebody to lean on when you need it. What is a past master and are you one? A uh, past master is a person that has served a year sitting in the east over a lodge. And when I say sitting in the east, that means uh, they were head of their Masonic Lodge. Um, <clears throat> yes, I am a past master in 2016. Just checking the phone was here. You know what? You want to take your glasses off because there's like a reflection coming up. Is that comfortable or is that going to be too annoying? No, that's fine. Discuss your Masonic journey. My journey in Masonry started a long time ago. As a little kid, I had a cousin that was a Shriner. And whenever I went out to visit them for the holidays, he was always in the local parade in his Shriner outfit. And uh, he had his little cart that he would drive around and wherever he saw me in in the parade lineup he'd always stop off and get me and I'd ride the rest of the parade with him. At that time I didn't know you needed to be a mason to be a shriner. So I'd, uh, I'd always wanted to be a, a mason and I drove past this building for years and years and years and I never knew that they only met in the evenings. So whenever I drove by during the day never saw any cars here. And then one day I was driving by and I saw Worshipful Brother Ben Hinton and Worshipful Brother Chiano Fernandini outside and they were selling Shriners onions. And uh, I stopped off and talked to them and uh, I remember I was delivering flowers for my wife for Mother's Day and I said, you know, I've only got a couple minutes because, you know, I'm, I'm working for my wife right now. And Benny comes up, he says, well, let me take you inside just for a few minutes. It won't take very long. Let me show you the building, tell you about some of the guys here, and I'll give you a petition. And about an hour and a half later, I finally got to leave. And uh, I made sure that I filled that petition out, and I got it back to Ben. And uh, he was the, the first person that I met in this lodge. And his friendships meant a lot. Let me get your tissue ready. Right Are you going to step up? I just remember he was there after my dad died. You know, I think that's a really, uh, it's a moving part in, in almost 
probably the sole reason that this fraternity exists for so long, I think, is that companionship and the relationships that we have with each other. And, uh, you know, these are people, as I said a moment ago, I didn't know Ben a year ago. And now that I have, it's been such a short time for me, but he's, he's meant a lot to me so far. And I mean, there's people that have known him for longer than I've been alive. And it's, it's I can't even imagine what he's meant to to other people here. And uh, I mean, I know if I lost a dear friend that I know for a long time, I, it'd be devastating for me. And uh, he's meant a lot to me. And I, I, I've seen what he's meant to everyone else. And a couple of years back, we did an outdoor degree and uh, one of our past masters comes up and he says, you know, Ben has top line signed a lot of people for membership in this lodge. He says, let's have a show of hands. Everybody that's here, there's probably about 35 people that were there that day. And uh, probably 32 of those people raised their hand. And I'll bet you of the members that are still in this lodge right now, he's probably signed at least half of them. And Ellie told me it was nothing for him to meet somebody at a subway shop and just start talking to them. And they'd see that he had his Masonic pin on. And by the end of their conversation, he'd handed them a petition and they'd become a, you know, a member of the lodge. He was in the hospital. That's how he met Jerry Parra. And Jerry was talking to him about it. And by the time Ben got out of the hospital, Jerry had already filled out a petition. And people like him, <laughs> You never hear a bad word out of their mouth. And they can sit down and talk to anybody. And he's a good one. By the, by the time he's done with you, you don't want to say no to him. <laughs> Are you okay to continue? Okay. What has masonry done for you as a man, an employee, and as a philosopher? Well, as a man, it's calmed me down a lot. Uh, you wouldn't know about my blood pressure, but uh, I'd say I used to have a bit of an anger problem. Uh, the slightest things would set me off. And coming around here and just talking to some of the guys and learning, you know, there's so much more in life. Than, than the petty bickering and useless arguments with everybody. You, you calm down. You, you never know if you're going to be here tomorrow. Take it. Take life for what it is. It's. It's. You know. You think 90 years is a long time. It's nothing. Um, as an employee, oh boy, when I was an employee, it was tough because uh, I was working sometimes 18 hour days and it was tough for me to get here. But I, I still showed up. Um, there's times I fell asleep here, but it made me realize even with customers, you know, customers like to push you as much as they can sometimes. And you know, as a person, you don't like to get pushed, but you, once again, you just gotta relax. Uh, philosopher, that's that's a tough one. Well, I guess it's kind of made me think: how long does each of us have? You know, try to agree with each other the best you can, and if you can't, agree to disagree, and leave it at that. What topics do you like to study in your free time? <laughs> uh, I'll be honest with you, I, I have very little free time. I'm a member of this lodge. I'm a member of a lodge in Illinois. And I think the last count was about 13 or 14 other Masonic bodies. And I'm an officer in almost every one of them. So any free time I do have is spent at a lodge. Uh, I remember my wife said, yeah, Join the lodge over there to give you something to do. You know, you'll be gone one night a week, you know, for a couple hours. No big deal. And now I'm gone probably six nights a week and almost all the time. But uh, when I'm not doing this, I, I spend as much time as I can with my wife. So she's important to me. And 
I want to spend as much time as I can when, when I'm not here or working. I'm just glad she uh, supports you. Like I get uh, enough guff at home just for showing up the little that I do. I can't imagine well, having that much dedication. She's uh, she's a, a florist. She's got her own shop. So she's gone seven days a week, sometimes 18, 20 hours a day. So uh, most of the time when I'm gone, she's at work. So it's good now until she decides to retire. Then she might be wondering where I'm at all the time. <laughs> Is there any life experience or wisdom you would like to impart to younger generations? If you're going to join the Lodge, become a member of the Lodge. Show up, participate, become friends with everybody. Get to know the people around you. You, know, you might meet somebody today, you don't know if you're going to see them tomorrow. And it doesn't matter if you think that's an old person, that they're a little wacky. They, there's always something that they can tell you. You, you know, I, I remember when I was young, I always thought, I know everything. I don't need to have this person tell me anything. But there's always some wisdom that everybody can always impart on somebody else. And they need to just settle down. And the kids, they, they got their phones out all the time. They're on the go all the time. You know, younger people with families and young, young kids, they've got their kids in every sport that's out there. But you need to take some time for yourself. And... I kind of see the coming here as a, a time for myself and, you know, meet up with the friends. You just got to, you got to have time to settle down and relax and do a little bit for yourself. I wish you had a lot of sentiments like that too. Really? Yeah, very close to it. And it's, it's where words couldn't be spoken. You know, people get wrapped up a little bit too much on things that don't matter. Yeah. Could you describe the relationships and bonds with your older and younger brother? You know, some people have problems dealing with older people, senior citizens, people up in their 70s and 80s. I've never had that problem. My, my Growing up, my dad was a member of the DAV and VFW, so I spent a lot of time with him in his meetings. Usually he'd just tell me, you know, sit there at the bar and keep quiet until we're done. But uh, there was always, well, you know, if you're eight years old, 30 seems old to you then, but there were always older people there to, to talk to, and uh, I got along just fine with the older people. I still do. Uh, we have to respect our older people. You know, you think about the people that are in their 80s. You know, they've either been in World War II, Korea, Vietnam. They deserve some respect. Um, they've lived their life. A lot of them have had hard lives. Younger people, it's, it's tough to say because, you know, just like me, everybody knows everything, and they just don't seem like they've got time for stuff. Uh, you, you try to make a one-on-one -on -one relationship with some of the younger people so that maybe they'll come back a little more often than, than a lot of the people do. But uh, as a younger person, you just, you got to appreciate the older people that are, you know, the older members, their families. They put a lot of time into this fraternity and into a lot of other stuff also. like to say to men wanting to petition a lodge for membership? People that want to petition a lodge, yeah, you have to petition for the right reason. Um, don't sit there and think, hey, I saw this on the History Channel or the Science Channel or I saw National Treasure and the Freemasons know some huge secret about something or they're running the world. Not happening. It's not true. Freemasonry is about joining some place because you want to become friends with other people and build lifelong friendships. Uh, I've got friends that are Freemasons in England. 
I met a few Freemasons when I was in Israel last year. Do I get to talk to them all the time? No, but that's what Facebook is for. Join because it's something that you want to do, not something that you want to gain. Well said. There's a little bit of a verbose question. <laughs> Hang in there. So admission into masonry is achievable by any man, yet it's exclusive. The structure of masonry can make a good man better. Will the quality of human life improve as the quantity of Freemasons rises? I, I would hope that if there were more Freemasons out there, that the quality of humanity would be better. If we take the things that we learn in this lodge room and we apply them to our lives outside this room, then that should be a betterment to humanity in general. And if more people were to see or go through the experience that we go through and take it to heart, then perhaps they would see that, you know, Freemasonry is good and it's making a good man better in, gen in, in consequence, not only that man, but hopefully his family, his neighbors, and society in general. What do you think the public's opinion on Freemasons is, and how would you like to be perceived? I think the general opinion of the, the public, I hate to say, but the public, I, I, I won't say that they've got a bad opinion of Freemasonry, but maybe not a good opinion in general. You've got certain religions out there that, there that are anti-Masonic, um, the Catholics, if you go back, and I'm Catholic so I can say it, so therefore it's not bashing any religion. Um, you had a Pope that wanted to know the secrets of a Freemason, and they said then you have to become a Freemason. Well, at that time the Pope knew everything, so he was entitled to know everything, and as soon as he was told no, you know, that, that put it down there. Um, Certain sects of the Lutherans are 100% anti-Mason. You know, look at our government. There was at one time an anti-Mason platform for running for presidency. Some of it's gone away. Um, I think too much of the public reads something in a book or in a magazine or they see it on TV or it's word of mouth, rumors. and They don't, they don't see it for what it really is. Um, everybody loves the Shriners, but most people don't look, believe or they don't know that Shriners are Masons. Because you see 22 hospitals out there doing wonderful things for kids. Um, I, I think if we can get our membership back up to where it was 15, 20 years ago, and we start getting a positive word out there, and let people see all the different things that we do, the different charities, the things that you know, we do for each other, we do for the public. I, I think it could turn around. It's just, it's like anything else. If you have one person do something bad, you just put a tarnish on an entire fraternity from one person's actions. Bush said something about that too. He's like, yeah, no matter how much, uh, you know. Thousands and thousands of people could do good. One person could mess it up for a, a long time until time kind of takes over and uh, things kind of right itself. People forget, or hopefully uh, the the uh, the good actions of the other thousands kind of brush that aside. There, there's so many people out there that are just conspiracy nuts, and they believe this happened. Well, the Freemasons were behind it. That happened. The Freemasons were behind it. Oh, you know, the Freemasons put this president in office, or they did this, they did that. Yeah, if we had that great power that everybody thinks, well, the world would be like a Freemason hall. Everybody would be getting along, there'd be no arguing. So you can tell that uh, we're not as powerful as people think we are. Yeah, in a way, man, people think that power goes uh, with wealth and high-ranking political positions and Really, there's power in brotherhood 
and power and, and love for each other. So uh, you know, you want to help other people succeed that you care about and want to see them prosper. Yeah. So in a way, there's power to that, but it's not like there's a conspiracy to it. I mean, that's how we should act. I, I was in a grocery store and I had my Masonic hat on, and, and this lady said something about. Oh, you Freemasons! You do this and you do that, and you're you're uh, cor you know corrupting the government. And you run the government, and I said, no, we're not. That's all just conspiracy. She said, well, you're you're not a thirty third degree Mason. I said, no, I'm a thirty fourth. We're even more secretive than the thirty thirds are, and she just got a look on her face and turned around and almost ran away. <laughs> I thought, stop watching TV and hearing rumors. Learn about something before you're going to bash it. For God's sake. It's only you're a 360 degree man. <laughs> yeah. Went all the way around. <clears throat> this kind of goes along with what we were just talking about as well. Freemasonry's history is preserved internally through thorough documentation and established trust among our brethren. How can outsiders embrace and trust Masons while they're excluded from the fraternity? It's a tough one. Um, trust isn't given, trust is earned. And I think it's just a matter of you being a Mason, people learn that they can trust you as a person. Um, if they trust you as a person, maybe later on they find out that you're a Mason and they realize, you know, I've known this guy for years and I've trusted him, he's been honest with me the whole time. If that's what the other Masons are like, maybe it is a, a good organization and, you know, Stop watching these people that put all this propaganda out there that are against them. And it's it's hard. It's it could take years to build up trust with with a, a group of people. It's it's not easy. That was question twelve. This is thirteen out of seventeen. Would you like to discuss any of the history of Indiana Harbor Lodge 686? Uh, I wasn't around for the old building, which was in East Chicago Harbor, um, I believe on First Street. Uh, I did get a chance to see the building before they tore it down. Unfortunately, I didn't get to go inside it. But, you know, the easiest way to talk about the history of, of this particular lodge is to say, go out and look on that wall see the 105, 106 guys that have been master of this lodge. Um, talk to some of the older guys that knew Benny Hinton. Benny Hinton could tell you something about every person on that wall from 1951 through present, if not, if not even earlier than that. That's our history. I, I don't believe that a building is history. I don't believe something on a, hanging on a wall is history. History of the Lodge is the members and the people that have come through here. <clears throat> is there any historical Masonic stories you'd like to tell, either personal or historical? Historical... <sighs> When I think of historical Masonic stories, I like to think of the Civil War. Not because the Civil War was a war or anything, but just the Masonic stories that you hear from it where, you know, there, there's a Confederate soldier who's injured and he gives out a Masonic phrase or a sign, a word, and somebody from the North hears it and they do their best to help that person because even though they're on opposing sides, they're still brothers. Uh, stories from when the South might have been coming up through the North and there were Masons in one of the regiments and they find out where the Masonic Lodge was and they go and they take the records, the jewels, as much of the history of that building and they get it to safety because they realize that that's history. It's part of their, it might not be specifically their history, but it's one of their brother's histories. And here after the war, 
all of its return to the, the, the rightful people. Um, people helping people. That's the history of, of the fraternity that I, I like. Um, Benny Hinton, like I said, he was the first person that I met in this lodge. And shortly after I met him, I found out my dad had cancer. And Ben was a great one to talk to during that time. You could talk to him. He didn't have to say to a, word, a word to you. He would just listen to you. And after my dad did die, um, him, uh, Dale Parler, and I believe Chiano all showed up at my dad's funeral. And I'd only know these guys for just a matter of months. And I thought it was really great that three guys that I barely knew, didn't know for very long, but they felt a bond and a friendship close enough to me to come on a day that, you know, I needed somebody there. Uh, that's the kind of history of the fraternity that people don't know. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I like that you, you illustrate the histories and the people and their actions, not necessarily a building. This building could burn down tomorrow. The charter's there, I'm going to miss that because it's the original charter. This Bible, Bibles, we figure at least 75 years old. Those are two things that are kind of irreplaceable. But everything else in this building, that's what insurance is for, can all be replaced. The people, you can't replace them. You can replace the person that's sitting in the chair, but you can't replace the person that sat in this chair or any of the chairs in here. <clears throat> you doing okay? You great or anything? Okay. Usually, well, during my year, I sweat up here all the time. Now it's actually a little chilly up here. <laughs> Can you detect honesty? I'd like to think I can. Um, after you talk to enough people, you, you'd like to think that you can tell a person that has sincerity in their heart when you're talking to them. Say a person that wants to join the lodge. You know, one of the questions that we ask is, why do you want to join this lodge? Uh, a lot of them will say, well, you know, for you know, I want to see the religious aspect of it, even though we're not a religion. Uh, some people say, well, I've seen the History Channel. Don't believe what you saw on the History Channel. Uh, some people, you just, at least I've gotten the, in the back of my head that I think this person wants to join because, you know, they've kind of mentioned, well, they, with my business, well, that's not the reason to join. So it, it almost makes me think that they want to join to make contacts, business contacts, not personal contacts. Now, there's, I, I don't know if it's, I won't say it's because you're a member of the lodge that you can start detecting some of that. I think with age, you start detecting that. Is a person being honest with you or are they just a huge BSer? Are they you know, trying to shine you on to, to advance themselves a little bit? I, I, I think people in general can detect that, but you, you like to take a person at their word, especially when they're, you know, they're coming into this fraternity. And I'm interested to hear your answer to this question, because I know you, uh, kind of a worldly man, and you're just, you know, uh, a learned man. I don't know a better way to say it. I could just. I, I have this feeling that you you're a smart man, and uh, that you like to just take in as much as you can and and just absorb it. Knowledge in general is kind of like that. Uh, when you you gain knowledge over time, um, you, you can't necessarily do something with knowledge. It's just something that's a part of you and wisdom and that that. Uh, anyway, enough of my rambling. I'll, 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 I'll hear what you got to say. So, uh, let's see, right? 
If you can comprehend the past, can you comprehend the future? I think that the future is kind of based on the past. Um, if you can't learn your mistakes that you made in the past, you're going to continue making them in the future. It's that simple. And it might sound smug, but if you see an, a Lodge brother, and they're making the same mistakes that you were as, a, as a, say, a dumb kid, quietly go up and tell them. Just don't tell them you're being a fool. Try to, try to change their path a little bit with some common sense steering towards it. Because you, know, you don't want people to make the same mistakes that you had made as a kid or make their life a little easier. Don't let them go through the, the stuff that you had to go through if, if, you, know, if you screwed up. Um, knowing your future, nobody knows their future. You have plans for the future, you have hopes for the future. You hope it happens, you plan on it happening. But you or I could walk out this door right now and somebody runs a red light. There's your plans, there's your hopes for the future, all gone. So you can plan, you can hope, you can see your mistakes from the past to help shape your future, but nobody really knows what their future is. I knew you were going to say something cool. <laughs> final question. It doesn't necessarily have to be final if you have to say it. But final question is what have you yet to learn? There, there's just so much in life and in this fraternity to learn. You know, the, the second you think that you've learned it all, I'm sure when you got done with your A book, you said, hey, I've learned this. And then you got your B book and you thought, oh God, no, another book? And then you got your C book. All right, here comes another book. Well, now that you're done with your C book, there's another book yet to come. And you've already mentioned that you want that. There's always, always, always more to learn. You're never going to know everything. And just take in as much as you can. Try to, try to listen to everybody, take in advice. People give you advice, take what you want out of it. If you don't like it, throw it away. You don't need to. But myself, I have a, I have a hard time learning ritual. So for me, it's read it, read it, read it, read it, read it, and then get up here in the East and forget everything that I just learned. <laughs> um, this fraternity isn't... The ritual work isn't about perfection. It's about getting a point across, telling a story to the person that's on the other side of that altar. Um, you do the best that you can. Uh, I had a past master tell me, being a good master isn't about knowing ritual work. It's not about getting ritual work perfect. Because nobody's perfect. You can get it as good as you can. So being a good master is about developing communication skills with the other members, building friendships with them, being able to make a call and say, hey, I need you to do this for me. Can, can you do this? And that person saying, sure, what do you need? Having a good attendance at the corn roast because you communicated with them and they want to support you and the lodge. It's about so many other things other than strictly ritual. It, it all goes back to friendships. And if you don't develop friendships, you can't be a good leader. That's all I can say. You just, this fraternity is friendships. And, you know, I go back to Benny. Benny's friend, been friends with people since 1951. And he's known people, for, you know, members for 50 and 60 years, had friendships that long. How many people can say that they've had friendships for that long? Yeah, I hope someday I can. Well, that's all the questions. So, I mean, your time is is valuable and uh, very appreciated. So, and I know this is a tough time too with Ben's situation. 
So, uh, you know, thanks for for showing some of that emotion to it. I mean, that really adds to it. It, it shows some authenticity to the things that you say. Um, it, it's it, the things that that touch us the most, mean the most. You can read books all day long, and as you said, I mean, you have to. You're, you're doing that almost as a means to an end. We gather for, you know, uh, for something interesting, and out of that interest, you know, we get to see a little bit more besides the books. Yeah. There's the the people that uh, that seem to, to matter something in our life, and and it's it's kind of irreplaceable, as you said. The link can go. People matter. You know. Uh, last year, I got I was fortunate enough to be able to get Ben down to um, a lodge in Rensselaer. So there was a guy that he worked with back when he was a pipe fitter, and I, another guy Ben is known for. 55 60 years now and he hadn't been able to see him in a long time because this guy can't travel up here Ben couldn't travel down there and I happened to find out what night they were meeting and uh, I called him up and said hey Ben you're gonna give me about four hours of your time we're going on a road trip didn't tell him where we we're going and we ended up down there and to just the look on his face when he got to see his friend it, it, it was priceless and the, the two guys I mean, we almost couldn't start Lodge because we couldn't get the two of them to stop talking and reminiscing. And being able to do that for somebody really means a lot. Um, I think we should wrap up. All right. Um, let's see, we got about 37 minutes in. So you didn't beat the Bush record, <laughs> which was about 58 minutes. But I wasn't Chiano either, 13 minutes, right? Yeah, he got, a, I think his was about 20 some minutes. Yeah. If it was even 25. Thanks again. No, thank you. I really appreciate it. I remember the first time I sat in the East, I was out in Valparaiso and I had to introduce the Grand Master. I'm thinking, are you kidding me? I've, this is my first time sitting in the East, and now you've got the Grand Master coming here, and I have to introduce him and not screw everything up. Sweating my rear end off out over that one. And like I said, now it's a little chilly in here. Now I don't have to worry about sitting here anymore. <laughs> <laughs>